It's Wednesday night, and I'm talking to you about several things in the Old Testament. I've been looking at the book of Leviticus. I've looked at it for years. I just hadn't looked at that only. I've looked at Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth. <laughs> I've also looked at all of these through the years. And Leviticus has kind of caught my attention. Leviticus comes from the word Levi. Levi is the third son of Jacob. And Jacob's name was changed to Israel. And his 12 sons, getting where I can't spell if I write and talk at the same time. And his 12 sons, starting with Reuben, and then Simeon and Levi, Judah, all the way down to Joseph and Joseph's two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, which took the place of Joseph, which took Joseph's tribe and left out the Levites because they were the priests of Israel. And God substituted them for Reuben. Reuben was the firstborn. He should have been prophet, priest, and king. But he was a very unstable person. So God says, I want you to pick out the Levites. And we've been talking about Leviticus since it's about the priesthood. Priesthood of Israel. Now you had priests... And you had high priests. Now, a high priest had to be a descendant of Aaron, of Moses' older brother. They had a father named Amram. Amram. And Amram was a son of Koath. And Koath was one of the sons of Israel. And all the rest of these men that were descendants of Koath, whatever they were, they were still priests. You had Koath, Gershon, and Merari. That's, that is the sons of Koath, which was the son of Israel. And uh, or of Levi, he was the son of Levi, and any one of the sons of these men could be priests, but only one of these people was the high priest. Now, this is the same picture as us in the New Testament. The Bible says, God hath made us priests and kings but you have to know what a priest does he offers acceptable sacrifice acceptable sacrifice and without being a priest you cannot offer sacrifice you had to do it god's way and if you tried to offer sacrifice and you wasn't a priest you could be put to death for it in fact you would be put to death so you have to offer acceptable sacrifice. He's made us priests and kings. He has, he has not made us high priest. There's one high priest over the temple of God now. And we are the temple of God. And we are commanded by God. Romans 12 and 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, Paul says that you present your body, your body is a living sacrifice, living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, acceptable uh, is a word that means well, it's the word aresko, A-R-E-S-K-O, it means well pleasing. If we're not priests, 
when we're trying to give our bodies a living sacrifice, first of all, we're not going to want to do that if we're not believing God. And we are acceptable sacrifices, and we're priests and kings, and kings declare righteous judgment, John 7, 24, look not at the outward appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Now, everybody is familiar with everybody's familiar with they're not familiar with it they just know in the bible somewhere it says judge not and this word in john 7 24 says judge now how are we going to know the difference well you got to study first of all any time you start a sentence with a verb judge when it says judge not that's a verb. Starting the sentence with a verb, you always have an understood subject. The understood subject is you. You judge not. Is God going to judge? How's he going to judge? Through our mouths. We look at the Word, see what God says, and we judge righteous judgment. John 7, 24. 7, 24, judge... When it says judge not, not, that word judge is, in, now everybody seems to know that the Bible says somewhere we're not supposed to judge. Well, we're not. All to declare judgment. Yes. Whose judgment? God's. When the Bible says judge not, Matthew 7 and 1, actually it says you judge not and you have to understand what the word judge is crino it means to decide most people think it means to decide guilty well that's true but there's another part of it which is what they do when they say judge not what it actually says is you judge not don't you decide who's guilty or innocent when they say judge not they are declaring their judgment and say let this guy off the hook you're not supposed to do any judging uh, nobody's supposed to judge him that's not true god has judged already and he's got his people and his family that he's declaring we are innocent innocent judging innocent does anybody remember what that word means what is the greek word to judge innocent. Huh? That is. <laughs> D-I-K-A-I-O-O. -O. Can you see how a man is justified? There, in the book of James, don't think you know what everything means. Justified doesn't mean saved. Justify means to render or declare innocent. So don't tell anybody they're okay. Just say, here's what God's Word says. I said it to a guy yesterday. I was witnessing to him. He's across the street. He's the brother of a lady across the street. And I said, God has chosen his family before the foundation of the world. They're either sheep or goats. I said, they've been sheep. I was going to say this Sunday morning, but I can't wait. I like this. I, I like this. You've been a sheep before the foundation of the world, or you've been a goat before the foundation of the world. And if you're a goat, you never can become a sheep. If you're a sheep, somewhere along the way, you're going to want to live righteous and holy and godly somewhere. And I said, if you never want that, I'm not talking to you. You're a goat. I left it at that. I said, I'm not talking to you at all. If you never want this truth and want to change your life, and want to start thinking righteously, I'm not talking to you, and God's not wanting you either. That's a good way to witness to people. Say, there's only a certain number of sheep, and that's a very few, and if you cannot hear God's word, and you don't want to live righteously, godly, and holy, we're not interested in you. Somewhere he's got to convict your heart. Well, he just kind of looked at me, and said, well, I'll see you later. I said, see you later. 
I don't try to get people to make decisions. I tell them, you are already a goat or you're already a sheep, and you'll never change. But God will change his sheep to come alive and resurrect them. All right. Now, where was I? So you don't have to judge people that are sheep. God will judge them. And you don't have to judge goats. God will judge them too. So when the Bible says judge not, it says don't you decide who's guilty or innocent. When somebody says the Bible says judge not, say, well, you're judging right now. You're declaring somebody is innocent when I know they're guilty because I saw them doing this. It's kind of like somebody's down here at the bank robbing the bank, and you say, oh, I saw him in there with a gun pointed at the, at the woman, and they shot her and killed her. Well, you're judging. <laughs> I saw that. The Bible says, thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not rob banks. <laughs> People are funny when they say, judge not. So the next time you see somebody robbing somebody, you say, I'm not going to judge you. i got to go now. That's really funny. Now, we're talking about the Levites, which are God's priests. There's two words in the New Testament. There's the word bishop. Bishop. Now, bishop and an elder. These are equivalent, particularly the bishop. The bishop is one who is over the flock. The word bishop is epi, S-K-O-P-E-O, -E episcopeo. We get the word episcopalian from that, except they're not overseers. They're plastic Catholics. That's what I call them. And it comes from epi, which means over, and scope, which means to see. It means an over, seer. Scope, we got our word scope that you put on a rifle, or you have a microscope that you look into, uh, uh, what's that little glass thing you look into? Or a microscope, it means to see. This is an epi, an overseer, the one who heads up the flock, and you have the word elder. That is not necessarily an official of the church. They weren't elected. They were just people that were helping the preacher. And uh, it's the word presbyter. A presbyter, we get the word Presbyterian from that, but it's one who helps the preacher with the flock. I want to just look at this has to do with the Levites. In the Old Testament is the shadow, according to Hebrews 10, 1. And the New Testament is the very image, very image. It's real difficult sometimes to understand what God is saying with a shadow. Go back over there in the Old Testament and go back to the 21st chapter of Leviticus. And this, I want to read this and then read something to you out of one of my books because people have got everything messed up. The preachers have got it messed up. They arrogantly interpret the Bible when it doesn't say what they're wanting to say. And uh, over here in Leviticus. Leviticus. Look here in chapter, I believe it's 22. Sometimes I, you know, chapter, chapter 21. It's talking about what a priest should be, and I'm going to read this again. He's not talking about us not being able to be priests if these things are physically wrong with us. The physical, physical imperfections, God says, what I'm going to do, I'm going to require all my Levitical priests that's doing anything in the temple 
I want them to look like priests, look like preachers of truth, and I don't want anything physically wrong with them so the people can't complain about them. Not that having something physically wrong makes you any less. What you've got over here in the New Testament is the very image or the spiritual. It's a spiritual. And then he says here in verse 16 of Leviticus 21, Speaking to, uh, the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, speaking to Aaron, saying, He's going to be the head of all the priests over there. He'll be the first high priest, saying, Whosoever he be of thy seed in their generations that hath any blemish, let him not approach the, to offer the bread of his God. And when they offered the bread, they had a bread offering every day beside the temple. You had the temple. They would offer a lamb, a lamb, and a bread offering every day, every morning at sunup and every evening at sundown, somewhere around 6 in the morning, somewhere around 6 in the evening. And they'd have a bread offering here. And he said that's the least thing that the priest can offer. So here's the requirement. I'm going to put strong conditions on being a priest, just like you do over here in the New Testament of being a pastor or a, uh, or a preacher. Everything over here is a shadow and everything here is the very image over here. So whenever it talks about imperfections, bodily imperfections, it's talking about us having no spiritual imperfections as a pastor. Now there's another word in the Bible. Let me give it to you real quick before we read this. Over in Leviticus. Not Leviticus. What am I talking about? <laughs> Not Leviticus. Uh, look at in Jeremiah 23 and 1. Jeremiah 23 and verse 1. And you're going to find this word throughout the Scripture. I've spoken a lot about it lately. 23 and 1. Woe be unto the pastors. Pastor, there's another word in the Old Testament. I talked about the sheep the other night. The word pastor is the word ra'ah. Ra. It's also the same word as shepherd. Same word as shepherd. So whenever you have a pastor, you have a shepherd. You have a ra. God says, I'm against the pastors of the flock. They stayed with the sheep. They lived with them. They protected them. David told Saul when he went to try on his armor, said, I have not proven this armor. Put it on. He's weighed down with it. He said, but I've got this little club here. I've proven it. It was, it was a rod. The rod would have, it be a, they'd dig it out of the ground, dig a tree with a, a way they could hold on to the end of it, either carving it out, or they would, then they would round off or make it a hob, hobnailed ending and they'd put, put uh, uh, nails of some sort in it. And when they picked it up to wield it, it was very dangerous. And David said, I don't know your armor and your sword, but I know this rod. I killed a bear with it. I killed a lion. I grabbed him by the beard and beat his brains out. I can get that guy. I really have proven this sling. I can hit, I, I can hit a hare. At 70 yards. You want somebody like that? I can go out there. David was not a skinny little guy like the pictures depict. The only reason he wasn't in Saul's army, he wasn't old enough. When they would go out there, those shepherds, they were very... David said in that 17th chapter of First Samuel, he said, I killed this bear with this rod, and I killed a, 
align with. And he's telling Saul, I, that guy is a lumbering nine foot six guy and he can't get to me or around me. I'll bring him down. I, and he went over and he got a, five smooth stones out of a brook. The stones have to be smooth. I said it the other day. I used to make slings when I was little. And if the stones were not smooth, they'd go like that. Like you couldn't throw it straight. But a smooth stone, and he hits him, hits Goliath right between the eyes. He didn't kill Goliath with a sling, did he? What did he kill him with? Huh? Cut off his head. With what? A with sword. his pocket knife or what? No. Sword. With what? With a sword. Whose sword? I don't actually remember. That's Goliath's sword. sword. I don't remember that. That's awful. <laughs> he picked up Goliath's sword and hacked his head off. So David wasn't some skinny little boy because the very next chapter, the chapter 18, he comes into town, and, and Abner, who is King Saul's captain of the guard, good man, really good man. Abner is a really good guy. Later on, David's nephew murders Abner. But when he comes into town, the women are singing. They're singing this song that they made up. Saul has killed his thousands and David his ten thousands. Saul gets livid. So Saul says, I, to sh I'm just simply showing you that he wasn't a skinny little shepherd boy. He's probably very wiry, very muscular. He just wasn't old enough to be in Saul's army. You had to be 20. 20 years old and upward is a phrase you find all through the Old Testament. Remember, 20 years old and upward when they murmured against God at Kadesh Barnea and they wouldn't go on the land to overthrow those giants, which were real giants, they were eight and nine feet tall, God said, every man 20 years old and upward this day will not go into the promised land. It, that was draft age, except Caleb and Joshua because they said, we'll go take this mountain of these Anakims, these men of Anak. So David wasn't some skinny little guy. Not like pictures depict him. <laughs> Men are always showing him like, like this, you know. No, no, he was a dangerous fellow to, to confront. Very, very trained with his club, with his staff, and with his sling. He knew he'd bring him down. They wouldn't, it wasn't God guiding the rock. David could do that every day. He said, this guy will never get hold of me. Back in the 50s, I never saw a six-foot-five guy. We are in a time of men growing taller. And I asked one of my doctors, I said, why do we see all these six, eight, six, nine, seven-foot guys in the in the NBA, and they've got some that are over t taller than that and among the WWF, that World Wrestling Federation. Why are we seeing that? And he said it's in the cereal that's in the foods that they're selling. But in 1954, 53, I've never seen somebody six foot five. Uh, the tall guys in the NBA were like six foot and six one. Bob Cousy was a big superstar of the Boston Celtics, and he was about 6'1". He couldn't play ball today with these guys. And, uh, but they said a man named Julius Trulson is coming to Diamond Hill Elementary, and he's going to be your, your uh, principal. And I, and the first time I saw him, he had feet about this long, and he'd clomp around the campus, and we thought, golly, wow, what a big, tall man. And he couldn't hardly walk because his feet are so long and clomped around. That's kind of the way I picture uh, Goliath like Julius Trulson. <laughs> That's what I think of when I think of Goliath. And a big, tall man like that can't do anything with you unless he can get a hold of you. 
David could have run round and round him. He said, I don't need anything but a distance of about 50 to 75 feet, and I will bring him down. Now, so we're talking about pastors. David was a pastor of a flock. When Samuel came down to southern Judah and God had told Samuel, go down there, I've chosen me a king among the sons of Jesse. And Jesse was David's father. He, he, he had seven of his sons to pass before him. And God said, it's none of these. And he said, is this all there is? He said, well, we got one. And behold, he's the youngest. And behold, he keepeth the sheep. That meant he was a tough guy out there looking after sheep. He would fight lions. He said he fought, he killed a lion. Had to kill it with that club or hit him with a stone. People sell David short. Like God didn't prepare him to come up against the lion. If he prepares you to come up against a lion or a bear, we're not talking about literal ones. We're talking about these false teachers. He'll prepare you to come up against them. And that's what he did with David. David was wiry, young. The next day after he killed Goliath, and those women were singing that song, the Bible says that Saul eyed David and he cast a javelin at him, a spear. He was already mad at David because the women were giving David all of this credit and glory for what he'd done. So that day, Saul is so angry at David that he says, I'm going to send you out and I'll give you my daughter if you go out and kill a hundred Philistines and emasculate them and bring that to me. David, he thought for sure that David would be killed as he went out there to attack a hundred Philistines. And David, I'm just showing this here as a point. David went out and got a hundred of the, two hundred of the Philistines emasculated them, cut off their genitalia, took it to Saul and says, here's two hundred to prove that Saul didn't believe he's going to be able to come back. While he was gone, he, he gave his daughter Mirabah to another soldier. And David just thought, how can, how can you do this? Your word's not any good. So from the start, we know in 17, he kills this giant. He's not some scrawny little guy because Saul puts enough confidence in him, says, you can go out there and kill all these Philistines for me. David said, I'll kill more than that. Now, let's, so when it says, woe be to the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, the word pastor and the word shepherd are the same words. And David slept with the sheep. He lived with them. He guarded them. Well, let nothing take care, take his sheep away. Would he have been called the door? Huh? Would he have been the door? Would I, I, I can't hear you. Would, would David have been the door like you were talking about? Sunday well, morning? sure he would. Sure. He had to set up his own. He would set up. He was the door of the sheepfold. They didn't build all the sheepfolds the same. Sometimes they would put a protective fence around a cleft of a rock. And Phil might come up here to this mountain and have a rock out like this, go upside the mountain. They were always looking for that, that they could hide their sheep under. And we say, we could sing that song, He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock. That's a shepherd's term. Now, all right, pastor. Let me just show you something else about pastor. Look over here in Ezekiel. I don't know why I got into this. But Ezekiel, I love this chapter here. In Ezekiel, the 33rd chapter and 34th chapter, this is about the, about the shepherds and about, remember, shepherd and pastor are the same word in the Hebrew. It means a friend. It actually means a friend one that you, that lives with you, protects you, feeds you like we went through the sheep the other night. David was great at that. 
He knew how to take care of sheep. He knew how to kill bears and lions. And it, like I said, it wasn't one of those African lions. It's probably something about like a cougar. But if you think, I want to wrestle with a cougar, no. <laughs> They'll get you and eat you up if you're not careful. Now, look here in the 33rd chapter of Ezekiel. And this sounds a lot like today. Here in 33, uh, verse 27, or let's go to verse 30. Also, thou son of man, the children of thy people still are talking against thee by the walls and the doors of the houses. They're gossiping about you, Ezekiel. They don't like what you're telling them. I think I've had that happen here. You reckon? And speak one to another, every one to his brother, saying, Come, I pray you. And let's go listen to this Ezekiel and see what the word of the Lord that cometh forth from the Lord is. Let's go find out what Ezekiel's got to say. And they're gossiping about it. I don't know why you would come to church and gossip about me as soon as you leave. I'm just trying to help you. And they come unto thee as the people cometh. And they sit before thee, Ezekiel, as my people, and they hear thy words, Jim Brown, but they will not do them. Woo. You're going to be judged heavily if you give the preacher a hard time. God won't put up with it. I've had people do me so wrong, tell so many lies here about me. And why do they do that? I don't know, other than envy and jealousy. They don't want to do what God says. I really believe daily cross, debt to self, self-denial, being very unpopular in the world, people don't want to hear that. If all men speak well of you, there's a cry of judgment going out against you. I really want to to em emphasize this to you. Somewhere in your life, people have to hate you. Jesus said so. And they'll hate you for telling the truth. And then he says, But they will not do them, for with their mouth they show much love. We love you, Jim Brown. I've had people tell me that there were people here that when they see me, they'll say, We love you. And as soon as they get away from me, you know, he just says the same thing over and over again, and he's not this, and bye, bye, bye. Look, there's a door there, and you don't have to come into it. It's kind of like watching on TV. You don't have to keep watching. Turn it off. But their heart goeth after their covetousness. And lo, thou art unto them as a very lovely song of one that hath a pleasant voice, and can play well on an instrument, for they hear thy words, but do them not. Listening to the words of God and saying, I agree with that. I agree with predestination. Let me tell you something. You do not believe in predestination just because you say, I believe in predestination. Predestination is not just a word in the Bible. The Bible says, For whom he did foreknow, for no, he also did predestinate. And most people think that's the end of the sentence. If you don't believe in the end of the sentence to be conformed to the image, to the likeness of Jesus, if you're not conforming to his ends, you do not believe in this right here. You have to be conforming. You have to be changing. That's every day. It's not one time. I know that I'm not the same person I was 10 years ago when I was 68. I'm certainly not the same person I was at 58. I am a million miles from 48. And I'm about a billion miles from 28. I've changed so much over the years. I'm not the same person. I'm not the same person since God put me in the hospital in my mid-40s and nearly killed me. 
not that person anymore. If you think you're not going to change, you're really mistaken. I, if I really believe everything you're saying, well, wait till the world starts caving in on you. And it will. God's going to deal with every one of his sheep in a real severe way. You may think, I feel I was the best kid growing up. I never understood when my father whipped me. Clyde, my older brother, would beat me up. and Daddy would come in the room. Y'all been fighting again? And he'd start spanking both of us. And I'm going, I don't understand this. My brother starts something, and I have to suffer from my father for it. I never did do things wrong, start trouble. Clyde did. He'd fight anybody. He'd fight and defend me, and then he'd come home and beat me up. <laughs> but that's okay. And I'm, you have to grow up. And you've got to be subject to a lot of sin because everybody here, including the little kids, you got this thing in your body called hormones. And boy, they get to flying as you hit adolescence and go into adulthood. Oh, man, the temptation is great out there. You say, I'll never do that. As a kid, I said, I will never do the things that other people do. I never cussed. Didn't talk about the little girls in a nasty way on the, on the schoolyard. Stayed away from the guys that did. I was always quiet and looking at everybody. But I got out there in the world, and I submitted myself to temptation. And when that happens, no one can stand up to it. No one. Now, Look here in chapter 34, verse 1. Word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds, pastors of Israel. Prophesy against them and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God unto the shepherds, Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves stuff. They take the wool of the sheep, they take the fat of the sheep. They take everything about them. They take them for their meals. And they do feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks, the nomos, the word of God? Shouldn't you do that? You eat the fat of the sheep. You clothe you with the wool. You kill them that are fed, but you feed not the flock. Preachers in America. The diseased have you not strengthened? Disease is talking about spiritual sickness in our case. Neither have you healed that which was sick, neither have you bound up that which was broken, neither have you brought again that which was driven away. It's talking about the shepherds. The same thing as the Levites. The same thing as the preachers over here, the pastors of the flock. Neither have you sought that which was lost, these Baptist churches, Pentecost churches, Church of Christ, don't seek anything. We're seeking only the lost sheep. We're not interested in goats. But with force and with cruelty have you ruled them, and they were scattered because there is no ra'a, no shepherd, no friend. You know, you're not willing to go to battle for the sheep. And they became meat to all the beasts of the field, and they're devouring them in these churches when they were scattered. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and upon every high hill, yea, my flock was scattered. Notice the word scattered is there. God said, because the Levites did not preach truth to Israel and didn't keep the bell and the grove out of Israel, I scattered the flock for that. And they're scattered and upon all the face of the earth, and none did search or seek after them. Therefore, you ra'ah, you shepherds, supposed to be the sheep's friend. I'm against you. <coughs> As I live, saith the Lord, the Lord God, surely because my flock became a prey, and my flock became meat to every beast, to Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome, when Ezekiel's prophesying, he is in Babylon. He was a carried away. He was carried away, and it's believed the second captivity. 
he was carried away somewhere around 597 B.C. You had a 605 captivity B.C. And then the destruction of Israel was in 586 B.C. The total destruction of, Jeru of Judah and Israel and Ezekiel is writing these letters about what's going to happen about nine years, ten years later. He's writing to tell the people. So, he's saying these are the things that have happened in Israel. And he says, Therefore, ye shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, saith the Lord, the Lord God, surely because my flock became a prey and my flock became meat to every beast of the field because there was no shepherd. It reminds us of when Saul, uh, King Saul, not King Saul, when uh, King Ahab went to uh, Micaiah the prophet and said, if I go into battle against these Syrians, against Ben-Hadad, will I survive? Ben-Hadad said, there will be no shepherd in Israel if you go out to that battle. You're going to die. And so Ben-Hadad put, put uh, Ahab on bread and water. Ahab put Ben... I'll get it right in a minute. Ahab put Micaiah on bread and water because he told him the truth. And he went to battle and he was killed. Now, there's no shepherd... Neither did my shepherds search for my flocks. We talked about the shepherds going out after the lost sheep. But the shepherds fed themselves and fed not the flock. Therefore, O ye shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Now let's go back over here. And where were we? Let's go back to Leviticus. Or go back over here to Jeremiah 23. Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture. That's chapter 23 of Jeremiah. Saith the Lord, Therefore thus saith the Lord God of Israel against the pastures that feed my people. This is talking about against the Levites that are supposed to be living right and they're not. Ye have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doing, saith the Lord. Now back over here look. To Leviticus. When you're talking about the shepherds, you're talking about bishops, you're talking about Levites, you're talking about the pastors, you're talking about the shepherds of Israel. If you're a Levite, you got the most important responsibility in Israel. You're supposed to be taking care of these people and not allowing all of this fire and tree worship to come into Israel. And you're supposed to be forbidding it, but they weren't. Now, go back over here to Leviticus. I'm going to give you why, what we have to be like. Everything in the Old Testament is a shadow. In Leviticus 21, this is a shadow. It, not saying if you're crippled or you're, or you're a midget or if you're, that you can't be in the work of God. It's saying you have to spiritually be developed. And that's why he put this in here so there would be no complaint against God's preachers. And he says here in verse 16, chapter 21, Leviticus, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speaking to Aaron, saying, Whosoever he be of thy seed and their generations that hath any blemish, let him not approach to offer the bread of his God. Whichever Levites have some problems, don't go to the temple. You've got other work you can do there. You are a Levite. For whatsoever man he be that hath a blemish, he shall not approach a blind man or a lame or he that hath a flat nose, or anything superfluous, or a man that is broken-footed, or broken-handed, or crook-back, or a dwarf, or that hath a blemish in his eye, or be scurvy, or scarbed, or hath his stones broken, no man hath a blemish 
of the seed of Aaron that the priest shall come nigh to offer the offerings of the Lord made by fire. He hath a blemish. He shall not come nigh to offer the bread of God. Now there is a New Testament. Let's go over here to to Second Timothy. It's First and Second Timothy. First and Second Timothy. <coughs> and Titus. These have an official name. They're called pastoral epistles. First and Second Timothy was written to Timothy because he was the pastor of the church at Ephesus. And any time you read about Ephesus, this is what it's talking about. Let me see if I can find here. Here's Ephesus right here. This is what we call Turkey right here. They've got Asia Minor. Asia, we think of Asia as being over here in India and and all the Vietnam and all those uh, Laos and Cambodia over here. We think of Asia being there or China or any of those other Oriental nations. We think of them being over there. But this is Asia Minor. The seven churches of Asia are right in this area right here. Ephesus is one of those churches. Let me see if I can find a... Let me see if I can find me a map. Yeah, here it is. This is Turkey right here. Turkey has got as much history of the church as just about anywhere in the world because Turkey is Asia Minor. You had the seven churches, Pergamos. You had Smyrna, Ephesus, Laodicea, Sardis, Thyatira. These churches were not among the seven churches. Philadelphia was in one of the seven, but Heropolis, Colossia was not, uh, and, and Antioch, Iconium, Lister, Derby. Uh, Miletus was not in the seven churches. Magnesia was not. Uh, Sardis, Sardis was. Troas was not. The seven churches are right here. That's Asia. Now, I was going to say something to you. I forgot where I was. Oh, let's finish reading here. In, uh, did I say we was going to Daniel? Second Timothy. Huh? Second what? Second Timothy. Oh, Second Timothy. Let's go to Second Timothy. This is what a Levite would be if he was here today. We're not talking about the Levites over here. We're talking about the pastors, the preachers of the churches here in Second Timothy. Now, this is a chapter that most people has really gotten completely wrong. I'm going to read a little to you about it. I'll read a little of it. All right. All right. Uh, excuse me, First Timothy 3. This is a true saying. And one. If a man desire the office of a bishop, an episcopal, An overseer. That's one who looks over the flock just like the shepherd did, just like the friend did over here. God wants the same thing over here. And just like he said, I don't want any imperfections over here, he's saying over here, I want the pastor to not have any imperfections. I'm going to give you his requirements. Here's what it says. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. 
A bishop then must be blameless, amamos, no blame. It doesn't say the husband of one wife. It says the aner, A-N-E-R, a man of one gune, a man of one woman. He has to be a one woman man. They had all kinds in Ephesus. This was heathen country. The dining of the Ephesians was here, one of the biggest, most revered of all the Ashtaroth in the Mediterranean region. They had a port coming in there. You could see this gigantic uh, statue of the Ashtaroth Diana. Ashtaroth was a common generic name for all the female deities, and they all represented in the form of a tree. And as you would come into this bay here, you could see this giant statue of Diana. They, they uh, would, and you had heathens everywhere. They had three and four and five wives, and God says, I want my men to be pure. He's not talking about one wife your entire life. That is not what this is talking about. You have to know these people and how pagan they were. He said, I want my men and my preachers to be without question honorable and godly. It says he has to be a one woman man the husband of one wife or a one man woman vigilant watching most of these guys in his churches are not constantly watching vigilant he has to be sober of good behavior they don't have good behavior they don't tell the truth given to hospitality and having an apt aptitude to teach. I don't know any of them that have aptitude to teach. Do you? I don't know any preachers that have an aptitude for teaching. First of all, if you think husband of one wife means you cannot have been married before, that's ridiculous. That's not the context of this whole thing. This is so that a man can take care of his house and be honorable and godly in a house. And then he says, not given to wine, no striker. That means one who takes the word of God and beats people in the head with it. Not greedy of filthy lucre, not greedy of money, and boy, aren't they ever that. If you go online and you look at the houses of these preachers, just go online and look up Kenneth Copeland's house. Look up. John Hagee's house. Look up uh, any of them. Uh, Joel huh? Joel, Joel Osteen's house. His house is about a ten to twelve million dollar super home in Houston. Kenneth Copeland's got a house on the lake on Eagle Mountain Lake, and it looks like it looks like some place where skiers go in the Alps to ski a hundred families. It's, it's outrageous. It's got 18, between 18 and, and 20,000 square feet. That is big as a small shopping center. These guys are greedy, a filthy looker. They lie to get the money. And then he says, not covetous, aphilagoros, A-P-H-I-L-A, a P H I L A U G U R O S. Philaga, Philagoras, A R G U R O S. I got it wrong. Philagoras means a, an affection for money or shining, and the F in front of it means no affection for money or shining. That's what a preacher is supposed to be. And none of these preachers are that today. One that ruleth well his own house. That's the way the Le he wanted from the Levites. One that rules his own house, 
how shall he take, if he can't rule his own house, well, let me read four again. One that ruleth his own house, having his children in subjection with gravity. It means honesty. You're not a good pastor if you don't teach your children to be honest. A lot of preachers' kids end up in jail. Uh, what's his name? Uh, the guy down in Atlanta, Creflo Nickel. He slapped his girl, ended up down, and she ended up going to jail because they had a fight. And it's just the craziest thing I've ever seen. For if a man knows not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice. Not a novice. Neophutos. N-E-O-P-H-U-T-O-S. Not young. You can't say, well, I think I need to preach. Well, how long have you been coming to church? Oh, about six months. No, you don't need to preach at all. I had a fellow ask me, I've said this before, he was about 23. We were standing out here after church one night. He said, and he pulled out his cigarettes and lit up, and he said, you know, I think God wants me to preach. What do you think? I said, no, he doesn't. <laughs> Not just that quick one, no. And that's the last time I saw him. Smoking his cigarette, saying, I think God wants me to preach. Don't think so. Now, he's talking about what men have to be. Not a novice, lest being lifted up in pride, lest being lifted up in tufao, T-U-P-H-O-O, -O, conceit. Conceit means to, to give out a form of smoke comes from two floss, T U P H L O S. L O S. It means blind. You're blinded by your own smoke. You're blowing smoke. Tufao. Not being lifted up in pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. And what is the condemnation of the devil? Well, it's he was proud. He said, I will be like God. I'll run things here in heaven. And he didn't. And then he said, not a novice being listed up in pride. He fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are outside the church. Lest he fall into reproach and a snare of the devil. The word snare is the word pagis. We got three words we're talking about. Proscoma. Proscoma, pagis. And these have basically the same meaning. Pagis and scandalizo. S K A N D. A L I Z O. A scandalon was the same thing as a pagis. It was a little sapling they would take, they would bend it over and tie a little noose around it, put a little trap there for some rabbit to come along and snap his leg and he'd break his leg and he couldn't get away. The Bible has much to say about this has to do with what you eat. You eat what you do that will cause somebody to be scandalized. We think of a scandal as gossip, and it is. And it is a trap that gets people trapped in. I Sometimes I can't understand why people will gossip about me and say things when all I'm trying to do is help you, that's all. I'm not trying to be famous with this big crowd. That's never going to happen with this message. With Daily Cross and Death to Self and Self Denial, it's not going to happen. I'm just trying to help the church. That's all. 
I don't have any ulterior motives, no motivations to try to sneak something from you or get your money. I never ask for money. I got these offering boxes. We never pass a plate. I don't, I got too much else to say to be talking about money. Now, so he says, in the same manner, or moreover, he must have a good report of them. Good report is this has the basic same meaning. That's the word report. It's a form of martyr, martyrian. And martyrian comes from the word witness, martus. You have to give a good witness to those who are outside the church. I'm always witnessing to people. I witnessed to a guy today. told him the same thing I told the guy yesterday. I said, God has got sheep and he's got goats. I said, if you're sheep, you're somewhere someday, God's going to convict your heart to live godly, righteous, and holy. And I said, if you're not a sheep, we're not looking for you and God's not looking for you. He's only looking for people that he's dealing with, and that's all. If he's, People say, how do you know you're saved? Well, you know because God's dealing with you and convicting your heart. That's how you know. You know because God is changing you from one day to the next. When Paul said, I know whom I have believed, he said, I see who I believe. I'm suffering for being a, pre a preacher, <coughs> an overseer. I'm overseeing all the churches. He said, I'm looking after all the churches over here in Asia. He said, I am their superintendent, and I have to take care of them. And he said, I'm suffering for being what I used to persecute. He said, I used to kill Christians for a living. There in the ninth chapter of Acts, he said, I made havoc of the church. It means to murder. I was killing them. What really gets me, this really amazes me. People try to take this chapter and make it mean you can only be married once to be a pastor. Now, you can commit murder like Paul and kill 200 Christians and torture them, but you can't preach. You Baptists are idiots. I was raised in that, raised around it. You can't preach here. Well, if you can't preach after you're divorced... And you can't pastor. Does that mean if Jesus comes to your church, you won't let him preach? Is that right? You won't let him have a revival. Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Because he's been divorced twice. <laughs> Do you Baptists know that? Have you ever heard that? That's idiocy. That's not what this chapter is about. It's about being upright. That's crazy trying to say this stuff like this. Look over in Jeremiah, the 23rd chapter. Let's see if Jesus has been divorced, okay? Is he the God of the Old Testament? He said, before Abraham was, I am in John 8. When he said, I am, they said, you're calling yourself God will kill you. Well, the I am was the, he was saying, I am the I am God of the Old Testament. And the I am God told Moses, you go tell the Pharaoh, let my people go. And when you get to Israel over there in bondage, tell them I am has sent me. So when he said I am, they went, boy, we're gonna, you call yourself God. Well, he is the God of the Old Testament and he divorced his wives. Look at Jeremiah. I don't know why the Baptists can't put, the, Baptist preachers are the worst in the world for condemning somebody that's been divorced. If, you, if you're an axe murderer and you get out of prison and they put you on parole and, and you're trying to prove yourself, you can go to a Baptist church and give your testimony and say, I used to be an axe murderer and now God saved my soul. And they'll say, isn't this a wonderful testimony? Now you can be an axe murderer and preach in a Baptist church, but you can't be divorced. It's the worst sin in the world. That's stupid. Look over here in... 
Where did I say was going? Oh, Jeremiah, the third chapter. Was Jesus divorced? Yes. It's just like, I think it's funny. They can't find these things. If he's the God of the Old Testament, he's been divorced. All right. Let's start reading here in verse 1. If a man put away his wife, and she go from him, and become another man's, shall he return unto her again? Shall not that land be greatly polluted? But thou, thou hast played the harlot with many lovers. Lovers was what the gods were called. That's what Hosea called Baal in the grove and Shemash and Molech. Yet return again to me, saith the Lord. Return to me, and I'll continue with you, even after you have committed fornication. Idolatry was called spiritual fornication. Lift up thine eyes. He's talking to Israel. He's talking to Judah. Jeremiah prophesied from approximately 626. This is the years of Jeremiah. Forty years. 626 B.C. to 586 B.C. Northern Israel had been carried away in 722 B.C. So they're long in the land of Assyria, and now Jeremiah is sent to preach to Judah, southern Judah, southern Israel, and threaten them. And that's what it is. God's judgment is a threat first. He warns people. Then he says, Lift up thine eyes unto the high places and see where thou hast been lain with, and in the ways that thou art, thou sat for them as the Arabian in the wilderness, and thou hast polluted the land with thy whoredoms. That's what idolatry was called, whoredoms. And with thy wickedness. Therefore the showers have been withholden, and there hath been no latter rain. Thou hast a whore's forehead. What does that mean? Revelation 17 and 5. Upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery of Babylon, the mother of harlots. A harlot, one who practiced prostitution, had to have a band over her head, and she had to have the name written of her pimp, who she was pimping for, who she was doing her work for. Babylon. And she's got whoredoms on this. He's talking about Judah. Jeremiah's preaching to Judah, southern Israel. Has to whore's forehead, thou refusest to be ashamed, Judah, where Jerusalem sits. Maybe I have to need to point that out to you, let you know who he's talking to. Wilt thou not from this time cry unto me, my father, thou art the guide of my youth? Will he reserve his anger forever? Is God going to stay angry with Judah and Israel, northern Israel forever? Behold, thou hast spoken an evil thing as thou couldst. The Lord said, unto, said also unto me, In the days of Josiah the king, hast thou seen which backsliding Israel hath done? She is gone up on every high mountain and under every green tree. What's a green tree? An evergreen. He says that in the 40th chapter of Isaiah. You've gone up under every green tree and played the harlot. And played the harlot going after these tree gods. See, God equates this with fornication. And I said, after she had done all these things, then turn thou unto me, but she returned not, and her treacherous sister Judah saw it. And I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery against me, going after these gods, I had put her away, and I divorced northern Israel. I gave her a bill of divorce. The divorce was final with a bill of divorce. That was called a get. Now, you Baptist preacher, going to let Jesus preach in your churches? A get. Get them. Now, you won't let Jesus preach, right? Well, they're ignorant. I was raised in a Baptist preacher's home, and I was ordained 
in the Southern Baptist Convention. And I don't agree with nothing they're doing or saying. And that was 1967 when they ordained me. Now, let's keep reading. He says, I saw where, when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I put her away and I've given her a bill of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also and went after idols. In northern Israel, Ahab brought in all this tree worship and sun worship by marrying Jezebel, the princess of the king of Tyre, just above Israel. And it came to pass through the lightness of her whoredom. Now here's what gets me. People say, you just say the same thing over and over. You cannot preach Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings, 1st, 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, uh, Lamentations, and then go on to the uh, Ezekiel, Daniel. You can't preach any of these Old Testament people without preaching about these idols that Israel went after. You just don't want to hear the whole Old Testament. You said it. You said Bell in the Grove once. You said that 10 years ago, so why do we need it again? Because God says, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. I'm going to whip you if you keep doing that. You ever done that to your kids? Why? Why don't you just tell them once? Huh? Why tell them over and over again? Because that's what God had to do, and he did it with all these prophets. Not to mention Hosea, Joel, Amos, Odai, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, and the rest of the minor prophets. You can't preach any of that without repeating yourself. And I've been accused of you. You just say, I was trying to go through the Old Testament. So it took me two and a half, three years to go through Genesis. We went through so many things in there. Because I didn't know that was there. I didn't know that meant that. I know you didn't. And then we went through Exodus, and I got up to about the 32nd chapter, and I wandered off and went somewhere else, and I came back, and I've been going through. I'm not just wandering around the Bible preaching on Leviticus. I said, we need to get people to understand these are the preachers of the Old Testament. They're supposed to be taking care of Israel's spiritual needs. And, and people, the word would come back to me. People say, we're quitting because you're saying the same thing over and over. I'm, t I'm telling you what all these prophets said. I can't preach about, people say, I like the history of Israel. I can't preach First and Second Samuel, Kings and Chronicles without preaching against these gods they were going after. That was their spiritual idolatry, adultery. That was their lovers. When God says lovers, he's talking about the spiritual things. Then he says, let's read some more of this. It came to pass through the lightness of her whoredom, in verse 9, that she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and with stocks. Stock is the word E-T-S. It's the same word as tree. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil in Genesis, the, first, the second and third chapter. It's with stocks. Same thing as the 10th chapter of Jeremiah where he said you've gone after these stocks. And then he says, And yet for all this her treacherous sister Judah, southern Israel, hath not turned unto me with her whole heart, but faintly saith the Lord. And the Lord said unto me, The backsliding Israel that I divorced, I'm going to keep asking you, you Baptist preachers going to let Jesus preach in your churches because he's been divorced, because he had an unfaithful wife. It, do you think Jesus would go through this and then say, I want my preachers to do better than I did? You're ignorant. The backsliding Israel hath justified herself more than treacherous Judah. Go and proclaim these words toward the north. Return thou backsliding Israel, saith the Lord, 
and I will not cause mine anger to fall upon you, for I am merciful, saith the Lord, and I will not keep anger forever. Only acknowledge thou, acknowledge thine iniquity, that thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God, and hast scattered by ways to the strangers under every green tree. Green trees are evergreens, aren't they? In the Scandinavian countries, they worshipped the evergreen because they said it was a magical tree. It could live in 40 below zero weather and not die. It could live in 100 below zero. So they said they're magical trees, and we'll take the, we'll take the evergreen and put them around our pagan temples, and we'll take the holly, which was a magical portion of the tree goddesses, and we'll hang it around our temples. And we'll sing the old wassailing bowl Scandinavian song, Duck the Holes with Bowls of Holly. It has nothing to do with Jesus. It's a pagan song. You say, Jim, you sure are wound up about this. I get wound up just preaching on it, thinking how ignorant these preachers are. They just, they don't care. I'm going to talk Sunday morning about details. I love details. The world hates details, don't they? Strangers under every green tree, and ye have not obeyed my voice, saith the Lord. Turn, O backsliding children. He's talking now to Judah. For I am married unto you. And I will take you one of a city and two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion. I'll give you pastors according to mine heart which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding, but that's going to be a long way in the future. And it's going to be spiritual Israel, the church. And it shall come to pass when ye be multiplied and increased in the land. In those days, saith the Lord, they shall say no more the ark of the covenant of the Lord. Neither shall it come to mind, neither shall they remember it, neither shall they visit it, neither shall they, shall they, shall that, be done anymore. Why is it they won't say the Ark of the Covenant? Because our hearts are sprinkled now, and our hearts the Ark of the Covenant. Where the Ark of the Covenant was, that was God's army and His winning people. When He took the Ark of the Covenant away, and the Philistines came in and stole it in the third chapter of 1 Samuel, Israel went to the bottom. At that time, they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord, and all nations shall be gathered unto Israel. It. That's what we are now. All the Gentiles, the word nation here means it, same word as Gentile. The same word, it's what the scorpions are, the false teachers. All the nations shall be gathered unto it. You know how I can take that phrase there. That's the Gentiles shall be gathered unto it. All through the book of Isaiah, Isaiah said, and the nation shall come to thy light. The Gentiles shall come to thy light. Same word. Goyim. Goyim is the word Gentile, and it's the word nation in the Old Testament. Or G-O-Y is singular. I am is plural. And the word nation and Gentile are the same word. But the Gentiles are not going to come till Acts 2, are they? Neither shall they walk any more after the imagination of their own heart. In those days, the house of Judah shall walk with the house of Israel. That's the same thing that Isaiah 7 says. The enmity will be abolished. And they shall come together out of the land of the north to the land that I have given for an inheritance unto your fathers. He says he's divorcing his wives, doesn't he? Jesus divorced his wives. Now, let's go back. Let me read something to you out of one of my commentaries about 1 Timothy there when husband and one wife. Let me read this to you. This is out of Hendrickson's commentary. Mr. Hendrickson, don't believe what these preachers preach in these churches. He says, let me see if I need to read back here. Uh, 
needs to be above reproach in the estimation of fellow church members. See also 1 Timothy 5 and 7 and 6 and 14. The word used in the original literally meaning not to be laid hold of, hence irreprehensible and unassailable is what is what uh, the Bible actually says. Preacher needs to be immovable. I will not be moved from the truth. I don't care what kind of condemnation comes upon me. I don't care how many people condemn me. I will not stop doing this till I fall dead. And I hope I fall dead one day right after the service. I hope I preach my last message and I'll fall over dead just like George Whitfield did. I have no interest in remaining on the earth except for the church and my family. And that's it. I am really tired. I don't think y'all even understand. I'm tired of the lies about God in the pulpits. I'm tired of people that come here and they find some reason to condemn me and make up all these lies. I've had people do that. It's just lies. I'm not mad they're supposed to do it. Did they lie about Jesus? They said, he's a Samaritan. We don't talk to Samaritans. That's northern Israel. And they had that mixed religion between the Assyrians and Jehovah worship. We won't talk to them. And they wanted to spit on Jesus. When they said, when Andrew said, we found the Messiah. And Nathaniel said, where is he from? And Andrew and Peter said, he's from Nazareth. And Nathaniel or Bartholomew, whatever you want to call him, he said, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? It was the septic tank of the world. It's the most filthy place in the world to live by most people's standards, especially the Pharisees. He had the preacher, according to Mr. Hendrickson, this is what he has to say. He has to be above reproach. Reproach means to be infamous. A lot of people that will condemn me for what I'm saying, they know I'm teaching truth. You know, and I believe the reason people quit here, this is the hardest message in the world. I told the man that we rent this from today, Don, I told Don. I said, Don, people in this town hate me. You're a businessman, you know that. I said, they don't like me at all. I said, if some of them could shoot me, they would and get by with it. And I just said, this is the hardest message in America. You tell people, daily cross, debt to self, self-denial, and you have to be hated by the world and carry a cross in order to go to heaven. I said, you can't go any other way. And you can't. When I tell that this congregation, I believe there's people here that that bothers them. Does that bother you? If you're not mature, does it bother you a little bit? Some. Jesus said, He that beareth not his cross and followeth after me cannot be a follower of me. You're not following Christ without a daily cross. And you get one from witnessing and telling people the truth. And I believe some of these kids know that and they're already being convicted by it. If you grow up witnessing and people want to crucify you, not literally on a literal cross, but put you to death. Death means separation. They want to separate from you. Let me read the rest of this. He says, one husband's wife. This cannot mean that an overseer or an elder must be a married man. So if it means you have to have a wife in order to be an elder, it means a one woman man. If a guy's even dating there and he's preaching, he's got to be honorable, upright, clean, not involved in fornication, and, and live righteously and godly and approach marriage from that viewpoint and not his own physical desires. Rather, it is assumed that he is married as was generally the case, and it is stipulated that in this marital relationship he must be an example to others of faithfulness, 
to his one and only marriage partner. Now remember, you're not married if you have a divorce decree. Again, if that's issued, and we find that in Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 3. If the marriage certificate is given, God said, God said in that verse. Look at that real quick. Deuteronomy 24. Why people can't see this, I don't know. Have you ever read this, John MacArthur? I heard him preach on this one time, and I thought, my gosh, you messed that up, John. Verse 1, when a man hath taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes, but he, because he hath found some uncleanness in her. And Jesus straightens that out in Matthew 5. The uncleanness was fornication. He says, I was talking about fornication as the God of the Old Testament. So you can actually substitute fornication here. He's found some fornication in her. Then he says, Let him write her a bill of divorcement against him. This is God. This is Jesus. And give it unto her hand and send her out of his house. And when she is departed out of his house, she may go and be another man's wife. Oh, but the man can't be another woman's husband, right? That's a double standard on the part of God, if that's true. And if the latter husband hate her, and write her a bill of divorcement, and giveth it in her hand, and sendeth her out of the house, or if the latter husband die, which she took to her wife, her former husband may not go and be married to her. But give her a bill of divorce, and she can go and be married to another man. But you're saying a man can? That's going to be a preacher? Your standards are double, you Baptist preachers. It's just wrong. Let me read what he says about this. This is Mr. Hendrickson. He's very excellent commentator in his, in his uh, books, his commentaries. Infidelity in this relationship is a sin against which Scripture warns repeatedly that this sin and those related to it were of frequent occurrence among the Jews and certainly among the Gentiles is clear from ever so many passages, among others, Exodus 20 and 14, Leviticus 18 20. Those people were heathens in Ephesus. He's saying, I don't want you having... Even if you're serious about marrying a woman, do it in a godly fashion. No fornication. Dressing correctly. Looking right. I sure believe all of this. I didn't believe this so much when I was young. But I do now. And he gives all these verses where this is, occurs. Then he says, And let us not accordingly let us not forget what Paul says in this epistle in 1 Timothy 1.10. According to the meaning of our present passage in 1 Timothy 3 and 2 is simply this, that an overseer or elder must be a man of unquestioned morality, one who is entirely true and faithful to his one and only wife, but with a bill of divorce, she's no longer the wife. That's what you have to understand. The Pharisees said they could put away their wives without a bill of divorce, and God said it's no divorce if you don't give her a bill and split, the, split all the monies and split all the property with her. It's not a divorce. So when you get over to math, into Romans 7, you get over to Romans 7, there's something that's understood here in Romans 7 where people try to come up and say, you see, if you go marry another after you've been divorced, this person has not been divorced in Romans 7. Let me show you this. It would have to say they were given a bill of divorce. That has to be stated. Romans 7. This is not a divorced person. It's one that puts away his wife it's the same thing as a Pharisee 
that says, you burnt the supper, I divorce you, get out. And she could take what was on her person. That's why she would tie her dowry in her hair. And she, all she could leave with was what was on her body. And Jesus said, I'm sick and tired of casting the women out in the streets. Israel was a poverty-stricken nation. It was like a third or fourth world country today. Fishermen were poor. Shepherds were poor. And he said, I don't want you kicking your wives out in the street any longer. All they had to do was say, I divorce you with no bill of divorce. That's what Jesus said in Matthew, the fifth chapter. He said, it hath been said, if you want to, if you want to divorce your wife, just put her away. Put away is just, it's the same word as apostasis. It's just cutting off all relationship with your wife. And Jesus said, no, I want a bill of divorce involved where she gets half the property. And, uh, over here in Romans 7, Know ye, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law. She has a husband. There is no bill of divorce here. To her husband as long as, as he liveth, but if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband liveth, no bill of divorce, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. It's not talking about a bill of divorce here. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no, she, she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. That's not talking about someone who's been divorced. That's talking about they put away their wives with no bill. And Jesus said, I won't keep putting up with this. Let me read the rest of this article out of and I'll stop. According to the meaning of our present passage is simply that an overseer or elder must be a man of unquestionable morality, morality, one who is entirely true and faithful to his one and only wife, one who, being married, does not in pagan fashion enter into an immoral relationship with another woman. In view of this, and they did that at Ephesus. Even the believers did it at Ephesus. The attempt on the part of some to change the meaning of the original, making it say what it does not say, that's what preachers do with the Bible, is inexcusable in harmony with the views of some church fathers. They go along with them that say that. An overseer must be a man. They'll say it means an overseer is a man who is, must be married only once, and that's not what it says. You're making it say it's something it doesn't say. Pastorals reflect conditions which prevail after Paul's departure from this earth at a time when by many celibacy and the virgin state began to be exalted above marriage. One cannot excuse an attempt to make the text say what it does not actually say in the original. The, assembly, the original simply says he must be one wife's husband. That's all it says. The real author of the pastorals, Naomi Paul, did not oppose remarriage after the death of a marriage partner. They're trying to make it say, husband and one wife, therefore, you can make it say anything you want to. Well, it means you have to be married to be, and you have to be married to one woman once. It's not what it said. Jesus was divorced, wasn't he? I, I get tired of this from preachers. I get tired of their self-interpretations. It's not what it says. He's simply comparing the preacher over here with the Levite over here. No imperfections. And our perfections are spiritual over here. I'm running out of time. Let's pray. Father, thank you for truth. Lord, help the church to learn to bow to your will. Give strength to all the believers here. We are the sheep of your pastor, of your flock. Guide us in everything we do. And as the overseer here, give me strength and understanding to help people understand their plight. 
We'll give you praise for everything. Lead us to elect. We trust you for everything that's going on. In Christ's name, amen. Mm. I don't believe what preachers say in general. Spent a lifetime deprogramming. You what you want? Why? Why? Why do you want it? Why? Why? But why? Huh? Because you like it? Come here. You what? You want this... You want juicy fruit? Yeah, big one. Huh? You want juicy fruit? Big one. Huh? Here, come here. That's juicy fruit. Raise a kid. After the Baptist preachers tonight, Boy, you are. You the most amazing thing that everybody condemns people over divorce is right here. It's a mistake by the translators. I don't know if you heard me preach on this. When I go into the interlinear Bible, here's what it says. The bill of divorce is crucial. It's critical. The Bible says she can go be married to another when she's given a bill of divorce. But in Matthew, the fifth chapter, his reference to the Pharisees and the Halakha when he says, you've heard it hath been said. That was their verbal law that they twisted the word of God when they translated over to the Aramaic. And, and he says, it hath been said, whosoever shall put away his wife let him give her a writing of divorcement. Writing, yeah, you went through that. And I have crossed out writing because writing is not there. That's the bill. Mm -hmm. That's not what they said. It says, let him give her an apostasy, a separation. That's what they said. Mm -hmm. Just separate, go in and say, I divorce you, get out. Right. It's not a full-fledged divorce unless the Less the bill of divorce is in it. It's not a divorce. It's not divorce. That's a getting. Uh, the get them. Get them. Get them. That's, yeah, because I was here a while back when you went through that. That's when I, because my brother Rick that came yeah. that Friday night, yeah. he was divorced. And the church of Christ was all, all over him about it. Well, they're lying. The church of Christ told him and his wife in Sunday school that if they both didn't divorce each other, can separate, they would both burn in hell. <laughs> That's what their Sunday school teacher told them. My brother, come on, he called He is an crying. idiot. He's a jerk. <laughs> yeah. Oh, he, was, he knows nothing about he what is. he's talking about. Oh, I want to steal a hook. All right, ladies and gentlemen. What are you doing there? I'm okay. Sure they, I'm ahead. It don't matter what they say. They're idiots. I, Lord, I told you, we talk and talk and talk. And I told him, I, I got that, that uh, tape for him. And uh, uh, he was... Yeah, when he told me that, I, it just broke my jaw just dropped. Oh, they're jerks. Well, they don't know nothing about the Bible. They're probably going to hell themselves. <laughs> I believe that. I believe Church of God's Doctrine takes you to hell.